Good morning and happy Halloween. Um, happy Honoring Eve Day. Uh, my name is Keith Vincent, and uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you today to Boston University on behalf of the BU Junior Faculty Gender and Sexuality Studies Group, um, whose members have uh, planned this event today. Um, it's, it's really exciting that this day has finally gotten here uh, and that so many of you have come to join us uh, in this event and celebrating the work of Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick. Um, it's really an amazing uh, testament to the impact that Eve had on so many people, both uh, personally and through her work. Uh, and we're all really excited about it. Um, when we decided to do this in May, we never would have thought that it would turn out to be such an enormous event, um, although we probably should have known that uh, we weren't the only ones who felt Eve's loss uh, incredibly keenly and wanted to mark her passing in some way. Um, uh, maybe because of that, um, that we weren't the only ones, we have seemed to have been blessed with uh, really good karma as we planned the event. Um, we felt like a host of benevolent little gods were following us the whole way, watching over us. Um, first, we came up with a really ambitious list of speakers that we thought it was very unlikely uh, that even half of them would come. Uh, so you can imagine our surprise and delight when every single one of them said yes. You can also imagine our panic when we wondered how we were going to pay for this. Uh, but uh, we... Uh, applied for funding and uh, luckily the university came through for us in a very generous way and we're incredibly grateful for that. Lin uh, Aaron is going to talk about the sponsors specifically in a minute. Um, uh, as you all know, uh, we had so many people register that we uh, moved to a larger venue. So we feel like we really have tapped into something, uh, a really great need felt by many people to come together and talk about what Eve's work has meant to us over the years to confirm our sense of her continued importance uh, in our own work and in our lives uh, and in, in our future lives. Um, we were convinced that the best way to honor Eve was to read her writing together. Uh, that's why we uh, decided to assign homework for the symposium. Um, and we hope that lots of you were able to uh, take this as an opportunity to read uh, or reread uh, some of Eve's work. Uh, as you know, each panel is, is, is devoted to a particular uh, text by Eve, and the panelists will be addressing uh, that, uh, that text. Um, and there'll be plenty of time after uh, their talks for uh, discussion. Uh, we've been really busy this week at BU uh, preparing. We hosted uh, two sessions with BU undergraduates that were very well attended. 40 and 60 were the numbers I heard uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday, where uh, we read Eve's uh, wonderful essay, How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay, uh, which is just as provocative and powerful uh, an important a piece of writing, I think, as it was uh, two, two decades ago when she wrote it. Um, thanks to Gina Kogan, Suzanne O'Brien, and Carrie Preston for organizing that, uh, making great posters and even uh, t-shirts. Uh, if you see Carrie Preston walking around, she has the uh, official How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay t-shirt on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, our, our, our group got together earlier this week to read and discuss the last two essays uh, on, on Proust that we've chosen for the panel today. A group of grad students got together yesterday to prepare. Uh, a, dozen uh, a, a dozen, at least a dozen faculty members um, put at least one uh, piece by Eve on their syllabi for the semester uh, in courses ranging from performing drama, drama, dance, film, and feminism, uh, where you might expect it, to other courses like Japanese popular culture, Buddhism in America, uh, and the New Testament seminar on gender and Christian origins. So uh, Eve is all over the place. Um, we heard rumors that similar things are going on uh, in other schools in the Boston area, and we're really excited about that, too. So hopefully we're all primed and ready uh, to, having gone back to Eve's uh, work and been reminded of what uh, she might call its, its rich affordances. Um, I'll leave the discussion of those affordances uh, to our panelists and to you all today. Um, but I'd like to start out just to kind of set the tone uh, with a little anecdote drawn from Eve's A Dialogue on Love uh, that to me is emblematic of much of our work and I think maybe the spirit of which would be good for us to, uh, to think about today. Um, there's a moment in that text which, uh, as, you, as you know, is, a, is a, among other things, a record of her therapy sessions where Eve tells her shrink, uh, her very nice shrink, Shannon, that sometimes she worries that 
he might think she's misrepresenting her relationships by saying too many nice things about her friends. I sometimes wonder, she writes, and then breaks into a haiku, as she does quite often in that book, whether you think I, that's five syllables, over-idealize over my, that's seven, friends, kind of wholesale. That's five again, uh, uh, for a total of 17. I do modern Japanese literature, so this means a lot to me, uh, <laughs> that she got the syllable count right. Uh, Shannon says he's noticed this about her, uh, but that he's not particularly worried by it, because if she does over-idealize them, she does it consistently, uh, and it seems to work for her. her, for her. Uh, Eve then tells him about a friend named Mary who, quote, described me to myself as sprinkling sequins over us all. She's right, Eve tells Shannon. She and they do seem numinous and glamorous to me. I always see the light shaking out of their wings. I love this image of sprinkling sequins and glowy wings. It reminds me of all those little gods in the embodied divinity field that she identified for us in, in Proust. On a few occasions when I met Eve, she always managed to make me feel like I was bedecked with sequins as well. With texts, too, she preferred to talk about what made them complex and beautiful rather than to tear them down. And it's this reparative disposition in her writing that's one, one of my favorite things about Eve's work. So I'd like to propose uh, that today, in honor of Eve and also in honor of Halloween, an observation of Halloween, that we sprinkle lots and lots of sequins all over each other all day long. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague and co-organizer, Aaron Murphy, um, who has a few more things to say. Thanks. I'll make this quick so we can get to the good stuff, but I have to tell you there are actual goblins and princesses outside speaking German. There are little children uh, studying German, so they may actually have sequins for us later on. Um, German goblins, it's really quite an image. Um, it, just quickly, I have the good fortune of talking about a couple of points of connection to today's event, and rereading Eve's texts in the past weeks together with many people, what I'm most struck by is her unbelievable commitment to uncovering, recognizing, and building connections among people and among texts, and that deep, deep engagement, I hope, is something that we can try to do here today. Um, but with this commitment in mind, I have to tell you about a discovery that this group that organized the event made um, in the planning of this event. The Junior Faculty Gender and Sexuality Studies Group, it's such an awkward name, um, but what we found out um, in planning this process is that Eve was actually part of a reading group, um, to call it a reading group is really way too reductive, a collective who will be speaking for themselves later today, so I'll let them tell you all the great stuff. Um, but a collective in the early 80s back here at BU. Um, so in a way, there's this interesting, fascinating connection between these two groups, a connection that we should have known about before, and we sort of had some sense of, but it wasn't until this event started that we actually had a real understanding of the work of that group and the ways in which that group connected to ours. Um, even though there are 25 years um, that spanned the gap between the origins of these two groups, what might be described by some as a generational uh, gap, right? Um, this is not a generational narrative, and this is not a family story. Um, the connections are there, um, but the connections are only partially there. For instance, we have male members in our group. Um, we have a different name. They were ID 450. We are the BU Junior Faculty Gender and Sexuality Studies group. Um, institutional recognition comes with a price, I suppose, uh, an aesthetic price. Um, we also labor, um, but in a different way. We have institutional funding um, and support in a way that that group did not. Um, so there are connections, but there are gaps. Um, and finally, I guess the most important one is that we have yet to publish in a lesbian sex magazine. Um, I'll let you tell them tell you more about that later on. 
So when we think about these connections, um, I just want to point out that to me, the idea of these two groups that really didn't know about each other but somehow had a connection across time that wasn't in any ways an inheritance, to me speaks to the kind of queer possibility that Eve writes about throughout her work, the kind of connections that can be made in the absence of traditional generational narratives. And so I love the fact that this event in Eve's name, in Eve's name, spirit was the occasion for this recognition of these two groups of each other and I look forward to forging that connection more powerfully later in the day today. Um, this kind of important connection is one that Eve wrote about particularly in her essay Paranoid Reading and Reparative Reading um, which is one that we'll be talking about later in the day where she discussed through the very personal example of her relationships with three friends in a very different context than the one I've just been speaking about. She spoke of the kinds of connections that are possible in the absence of normal generational narrative, the kinds of identifications that happen when an older person doesn't love a younger as someone who will someday be where she now is, or vice versa. As she puts it, the connection that happens when no one is, so to speak, passing on the family name. Instead, the connection she describes is something else. It is one another immediately, one another as the present fullness of a becoming whose arc may extend no further, whom we each must learn to apprehend, fulfill, and bear company. So today, under very di different circumstances and in some ways painful ones, um, I hope that we can learn to apprehend, fulfill, and bear company with each other. Um, and now I have the great pleasure of saying a few quick thank yous because of course bearing company always comes with a lot of work. So I first have to thank our sponsors, the Boston University Humanities Foundation, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Department of English, the Department of Modern Language and Comparative Literature, the Women's Studies Program, the Department of Psychology, the Department of Religion, the School of Theology. I'd like to give them a special shout out. Um, the Department of Romance Studies, the Distinguished Teaching Professor of the Core Curriculum. Um, those are our wonderful substantive financial sponsors. But then we've had other kinds of sponsors. Our wonderful, wonderful um, graduate assistant, Emily Griffiths-Jones, who without whom none of you would uh, have seats or walk <laughs> Water or coffee or anything. And, and Keith and I would have had nervous breakdowns, so thank you to her. Um, to Shelly Rambo for arranging our media and filming. To Anthony Lee for all of our graphics and that fabulous poster. The poster that has gone all around the world. Um, to Amanda Trainer, Christine Loken Kim, and Carly Pack Bailey for all their um, administrative support and encouragement. And to all of our Min, uh, army of graduate students who have been volunteering, whose names are listed in the program. Thank you so much for all of that support. And finally, to all of our speakers and readers today um, who are here um, for little more than a free meal, giving so generously of their time and intellectual powers. Um, but of course, all of these thank yous are somewhat misplaced because none of you are doing this for us. We are all doing this for Eve. Um, and so for that, since this is all about Eve, I'm going to stop talking. Um, but what I do need to do is also, um, it's my very great honor to introduce Hal Sedgwick, who has agreed to kick off our day with a few words. Um, Hal, please, thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I'm, I'm grateful to Anna Henchman and Aaron Murphy and Keith Vincent for organizing this symposium, honoring Eve, and also for very kindly inviting me uh, to be here. Um, it's, it's almost 25 years ago that Eve was on the faculty at BU, uh, living just down the block from here in a, a narrow little walk-up apartment in the shadow of Fenway Park. Um, it surprised me, thinking back, to realize that Eve only taught at BU for two years. That time had a much larger place in her life than its brevity might suggest. Um, Eve was very happy to be here. She had inherited $1,500 from her grandparents and used it to buy her first computer. It was the first of the portable computers. It had a four-inch screen, um, 
weighed about 20 pounds, <laughs> and looked remarkably like a portable sewing machine. <laughs> um, from a restaurant supply company, she bought a cart on wheels. It was called a rolling relish tray. <laughs> Put the computer on it, wheeled it up to the edge of her bed, and sat propped up in bed, writing between men. As some of you know, Eve had been scheduled to lecture at BU this past February. She was uh, so much looking forward to visiting here uh, that last fall, when her illness increasingly made it seem unlikely that she would be able to travel. She canceled various engagements one after another, but hung on to the possibility of the BU lecture until the very last moment when it was ines inescapably clear that she simply could not do it. Um, this symposium is, to me, a powerful way of honoring Eve's wish to be present at BU, present not just in our memory of her, but as she had wished to be with her lecture present in her ongoing work. Um, as is clear from the rich program of talks and performances that are planned for today, Eve's work is ongoing. It continues to give us pleasure continues to make us just a little bit smarter and continues to give us encouragement and ideas as we develop new work of our own. I want to take this opportunity to mention another effort aimed at continuing Eve's work. Uh, several of us are developing a website that will soon, surely before the end of the year, be found at evekosofskysedgwick.org. Uh, we have several ambitions for this website. We want it to provide a guide to those who are new to Eve's life and work, and to provide an archival resource to her friends and colleagues. We also want it to be a portal to events, publications, and other websites concerned with work by and about Eve. Finally, we hope to provide a site where conversations occur a place for developing and sharing work that draws on or intersects with hers. We'll be exploring ways of nurturing such an online community, and we welcome suggestions, both while we're building the website and after it's launched. We invite your participation. Thanks. So since we've gotten sort of a late start, um, we'll move right into our first panel if our panelists can come on up. I'm so pleased to be here with these three um, wonderful speakers for our first panel, Feminism and Queer Theory. Um, in 1992, Eve Sedgwick wrote um, about the process of writing between men, which she, which she published in 1985. I wanted needed feminist scholarship to be different. In particular, I found oppressive the hygienic way in which a variety of different institutional, conceptual, political, ethical, and emotional contingencies promised, threatened, to line up together so neatly in the development of a feminocentric field of women's studies in which the subjects, paradigms, and political thrust of research, as well as the researchers themselves, might all be identified with the female. Since Eve wrote that uh, sentence, that very long, wonderful, expansive sentence, um, much has changed in both women's studies and queer studies. Um, both have become increasingly institutionalized and a lot has happened. So we thought it would be appropriate to start off our day by turning back to epistemology of the closet 
the text that perhaps had the largest impact um, in Eve's early work in terms of reimagining the relationship between feminism and queer theory. And so I am pleased today to have three speakers. I'm going to um, introduce them as they speak. So Carolyn Williams is our first speaker. She is the, an associate professor of English at Rutgers University. Before going to Rutgers, she taught in the BU English department together with Professor Sedgwick and participated in the ID 450 um, collective, and of course she'll be performing later today, so stick around. Um, she specializes in Victorian poetry, autobiography, theater, and visual culture. She is the author of Transfigured World, Walter Pater's Aesthetic Historicism, and Gilbert and Sullivan, Gender Genre Parody, which is forthcoming from Columbia University Press in 2010. And she's currently working on a book about the aesthetic form of Victorian melodrama. Her other publications include Moving Pictures, George Eliot and Melodrama, Walter Pater, Transparencies of Desire, Pater's Impressionism and the Form of Historical Revival, and she was awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship in 2004, and she is also the Warren I. Sussman uh, Excellent, received the Warren I. Sussman Award for Excellence in Teaching, so she's got it all. Um, in addition, I have to acknowledge um, Carolyn Williams is also a maven of the interdisciplinary. Um, and I, among many others, have benefited from her ability to bring different people together to think together. So it seems absolutely appropriate that Carolyn gets us started today. Please help me welcome Carolyn Williams. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. That was really wonderful of you. And um, I, I just want to begin by saying how extremely happy I am to be back here um, under the auspices of Eve Sedgwick. Uh, I passed out a handout um, uh, with the axioms from Axiomatic, uh, just in case we would want to have that together uh, for the discussion. And um, before I start my paper, I one final thing I want to say is that Eve um, very explicitly wanted uh, this work to be useful and practical. And she said very, very often and, in, and wrote in Epistemology of the Closet that she hoped it would um, be the springboard for much future work different from her own. And um, of course it has been. And, um, and always will be, and, and I, that, that to me is the most amazing thing about Eve's work, that, that she wants it to be useful. Um, so, I'll begin. I'll always be happy to remember that I was the junior member on the hiring committee that lured Eve from Hamilton College to BU. We were unanimously amazed by her essay on the Gothic veil, which would soon appear in PMLA but greater admiration would follow in due course. Though it was not published until 1985, Eve wrote between men while she was at BU, as Hal has mentioned, living down the street and around the corner from here in a tiny apartment on Deerfield Street. We heard Eve describe the male homosocial continuum and its significance for literary history as part of a wonderful paper on Adam Bede that she delivered at the English Institute. Later, also at the English Institute, we heard her interpretation of Willie Nelson singing the Baptist hymn, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. A song addressed to Jesus that Eve read as a prime example of male homosocial sentimentality. Then, in a two-day extravaganza that drew huge audiences to BU, we heard Eve deliver lecture versions of Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 of Epistemology of the Closet, the first centering in her reading of the Queen Esther narrative and its um, efficacious attempt to specify queer coming out as opposed to other forms of coming out, and the second centering in her reading of Billy Budd, after the homosexual. So we in Boston, and especially we at BU, were among the first to appreciate the force of these arguments. And yes, we did feel that we were at the center of the universe somehow. How delicious it was then to those of us who had also witnessed William Bennett's role here. 
as John Silber's demonic sidekick <laughs> to read Eve's full frontal attack on him in Epistemology of the Closet. We will hear later about and from the feminist collective Eve founded with Deborah Swedberg, the ID450 Collective, a group that continues to influence the work of so many of us. But in the time remaining to me, I want to emphasize, as Eve does, the continuity, or rather the persistence, in her theoretical project from the emphasis in between men on gender to the emphasis on sexuality in epistemology of the closet. Of course, she is interested in theorizing this conceptual shift in her own thinking. And, the sec and in the section on axiom two, she distinguishes among dominant theoretical models for conceptualizing the relation between sex, gender, and sexuality. Thus, her anti-homophobic argument begins by insisting on the irreducible entanglements of gender and sexuality, but also on their necessary separation. But axiom two, crucially, comes after axiom one the axiom fundamental to her project. People are different from each other. In that section, she sketches out the largest possible catchment area for sexuality, which, as she points out, does not always have to do with object choice. Um, and this is a quote from that section. Even identical genital acts mean very different things to different people. Many people have their richest mental and emotional involvement with sexual acts that they don't do or even don't want to do. For some people, preference for a certain sexual object, act, role, or scenario can only be experienced as innate, while for others it feels like a choice. For some people, sexuality provides a needed space of cognitive hyperstimulation, while for others, sexuality provides a needed space of routine and habit. Some people like spontaneous sexual scenes, while others like highly scripted ones. And the axes of critical differentiation continue, ending with some people, homo, hetero, and bisexual, experience their sexuality as deeply embedded in a matrix of gender meanings. Others of each sexuality do not." End quote. Focusing our attention on the very oddness of the historical fact that modern homo-heterosexual definition is so relentlessly dichotomous and oppositional, she unfolds the major arguments of the book. That homo-heterosexual definition is saturated with two clusters of incoherence. One set of incoherences has to do with the ruling paradigm clash between minoritizing and universalizing views of homosexuality. The other set of incoherences has to do with two contradictory tropes of gender through which same-sex desire can be understood the way same-sex object choice, on the one hand, th is theorized and perhaps is experienced as liminality or transitivity between genders, as in the masculine woman or the feminine man, the model of inversion, and on the other hand, is theorized as an impulse toward separatism within each gender. It's not that she wants to adjudicate the truth of either proposition, in fact, she argues that there is no standpoint of thought from which either question could be intelligibly adjudicated. Indeed, she concludes chapter one, the more promising project would seem to be a study of the incoherent dispensation itself. And thus she confronts the incoherence, looking for points of volatility and leverage within the tangle of contradictions she calls this epistemological stranglehold. She gathers evidence from the painstaking process of reading texts and from repeated acts of re- and de-contextualization, historically speaking. With humor, with incredibly lush language, 
and a vocabulary very chewy in the mouth. With fierce tenacity, she works through several sets of the definitional binarisms that she unfolds from the works of the late 19th century. She defends the reductiveness of this procedure by arguing that it is necessary at first to risk overcoherence in the attempt to expose the incoherence that is her real object of analysis. While she approves the finesse of some deconstructive practices, Eve stopped short and expressed her disapproval of certain others. She is particularly harsh about any critical process that concludes in undecidability or the infinite plurality of difference. Into these fatuous non-conclusions, she argues, the machinery of heterosexist presumption and homophobic projection will already have had ample time to creep, erasing or relativizing the specific difference that is her subject. A nominally pluralistic reading, she explains, will often be simply a quiet way of hiding the copies of gay community news and sending the lover off to the library before mom arrives for brunch. And speaking of mom, Eve builds the angry peroration of epistemology of the closet on the stubborn exclusion of women from the ranks of the knowing. Beginning with the striking assertion that a female or female identified reader is the dominant implied reader of Proust, she then further, she then goes further arguing that precisely the intended consumer of a la recherche is not just any woman reader, but specifically someone in the position of the mother of the narrator or the author. This projected mother reader is precisely the one who must not see into the closet because either A, the revelation would kill her, or B, she would chillingly reject the vulnerable, closeted one with all the force of her willful ignorance. In either case, what we have, argues Eve, is the attribution of an extreme or even ultimate power to the auditor who is defined at the same time as the person who cannot know. Eve names this anti-feminist projection the topos of the omnipotent but unknowing mother. At the end of Epistemology of the Closet, she reacts furiously against the homophobic construction by men of the figure of the woman who can't know as the supposed ultimate consumer for presentations of male sexuality. As evidence that this topos lives on, she adduces the flagrantly inflammatory 1987 front page article in the New York Times entitled, AIDS Specter for Women, the Bisexual Man. For those of you who might not remember, this article concentrated the figure of the shadowy, furtive, bisexual man as the bridge over which AIDS would cross from the minority group to the general public. As Eve points out, this article hypothesizes the minoritizing view of AIDS, the view that it was dangerous to certain quote-unquote risk groups in particular, giving way to a universalizing view that it was dangerous to the public at large. So she seizes the occasion to point out again the incoherent overlay of these two views of homo-heterosexual definition. But next to the punitive pseudoscientific projection of this specter in the first place, her fiercest anger is aroused by the paranoid position the scenario creates for women. The way the article assumes that women must know in order to protect themselves, yet can't possibly know that their sexual partners may be closeted men. We must remember, though, that she is on the very verge of ending the book, and she's in the midst of a reading of Proust. She reaches beyond her present subject, in other words, to suggest that we could become cognizant of how, quote, figures of women seem to preside dumbly or pseudo-dumbly over both gay and homophobic constructions of male sexual identity and secrecy in a la recherche. To attend to these figures of women she insists, would be no less dangerously energizing than the subject she has in fact been pursuing throughout the entire book, 
which has been oriented around male relations of knowing, recognizing, classifying, projecting, and engaging. At the very end of epistemology of the closet, in other words, Eve returns to gender, her own, and points us back to that way of reading. Though the forces even of her beloved Proust seem in some ways to be arrayed against her in the end, with exquisite humor and anger, she asserts herself as a knowing subject and occupies the ground of her knowing. And here, for my conclusion, I want to quote the last mordantly understated lines of Epistemology of the Closet. Willy-nilly, however, I have of course been occupying that ground all along. And even though that way of reading cannot perhaps in the present text be my subject, it has nevertheless always been my project. Thank you, Carolyn. That was lovely. Our next speaker is Professor Lee Edelman, who is the Fletcher Professor of English Literature at Tufts University, um, and he is currently the chair of the English department there as well. His work began originally uh, as, uh, in the 20th century American field, um, but his work really knows no bounds like that. Most recently, I saw him give a wonderful paper on queer Shakespeare, actually. Um, so he, he moves around, um, and he has become a crucial figure in the um, imagining and building of queer studies more broadly. His monographs include No Future, Queer Theory in the Death Drive, and I never know how to say this right, hum homographesis? Homographesis. homographesis, of course. Um, essays in gay, literary, and cultural theory, thank you. Um, and his work has been translated into French, Dutch, and Japanese. Um, no Future has really helped to form the new conversations about queer temporality that have been so important and has actually really changed the way that we think about politics and temporality today. So I'm very happy to have him with us today. Um, and so I'll hand the mic to you. Thank you. So I just want to preface this paper with a, a very brief anecdote, and that is that I actually met Eve too long ago to actually identify the years um, through a letter that I wrote to her. And in a certain sense, this paper is a return to that original letter. It focuses on the same issues, and it makes clear the the loving and respectful differences that animated our work throughout our careers and the ways in which, on a certain level, the whole of my enterprise has been arguing against the very reparativity that Eve, toward the later years of her career, came to embrace and why, in fact, I believe that loving Eve, respecting Eve, and honoring Eve means also recognizing the importance of and enabling paranoia in her work. The paper is titled, Unnamed. Given the salience, etymologically, of honesty to honor, we might start with a bit of honesty if we want to honor Eve. The rubric assigned to this panel, Feminism and Queer Theory, performs in its blandly copulative way a violence against which the passion, and not just the keen intellectual passion, unleashed in epistemology of the closet takes aim. The snugness of relation in the pairing that lets these two, or perhaps these multiples, here called feminism and queer theory, share a space in what proves to be the closet of hendiatic singularity, belies the persistent tension between them that is, as much as anything else, the stake in the introduction and opening chapter of Sedgwick's epistemology. It substitutes, moreover, queer theory a term that never appears in the book, for what Sedgwick calls a gay male-oriented or anti-homophobic analysis, positioned explicitly in a troubled and troubling relation to feminist discourse. There are reasons, of course, why feminism can couple more comfortably with queer theory than with a gay male-oriented analysis. The latter would foreground divisions between male and female, between gender and sexuality, while the former suggests a more pacific, 
or even reparative encounter. But for just this reason, the title's substitution of queer theory, something still to come while Sedgwick was writing epistemology, for the specific terms deployed in her book to name its theoretical practice, epistemology twice will quote the word queer, but never once make use of it, suggests the consequential erasure of a name, an erasure that never, I hope to show, escapes determination by the interdependence of epistemology and the closet. In beginning with this erasure, though, I want to make clear that I find no fault with anyone involved in proposing, selecting, or approving the title of this panel, nor do, <laughs> nor do I aim to defend identitarian claims such as those that attach to gay male. The erasure of the name that closets gay male while invoking epistemology of the closet speaks rather to a structural principle informing the social relations of knowledge that Sedgwick's text both examines and, like the panel's rubric, enacts. In the little time I have today, I want to consider a set of relations among feminism, gay male-oriented analysis, and the queer theory that here takes its place in order to see what queer theory could say about substitutive identifications and the closeting of names a closeting that Sedgwick's text at once anticipates, performs, and sheds light on. I begin then with Sedgwick's own account of the closeting of a name. Early in the introduction to epistemology, she writes, quote, I think of a woman, a man and a woman I know, best friends who for years canvassed freely the emotional complications of each other's erotic lives the man's eroticism happening to focus exclusively on men. But it was only after one particular conversational moment, fully a decade into this relationship, that it seemed to either of these friends that permission had been given to the woman to refer to the man in their conversation together as a gay man." Unquote. As if condensing in advance her reading of May Bartram in The Beast in the Jungle, Sedgwick carefully sets this scene as one in which a woman's awareness of something intimate to the man needs a sign from him before that knowledge can emerge as a property they share. But what's shared here, the explicit naming as gay of the man whose erotic life, we are told, just happens to focus on men, as if this were not an essential prop of the cathexes sustaining their friendship, creates a screen whose vivid pattern the arabesque of gay male sex, lets the naming of what was unnamed before screen out what goes without naming still, the woman's sexuality. If a certain nomination of his makes it something they can share, nothing, at least as the story is told, permits the naming of hers. She, the woman who knows, in this like Sedgwick who begins the anecdote affirming that she knows the woman and the man, is never other than woman here, the subject of a gendered position whose analysis feminism provides. He, however, moves from a symmetrically gendered position as man to the sexually determined position whose analysis belongs to Sedgwick's anti-homophobic or gay male-oriented theory. A theory that has, she goes on to declare, like male gay writing and activism, quote, a lot to learn from asking questions that feminist inquiry has learned to ask." Unquote. As gay male theory must learn what feminist inquiry already knows, so the woman in Sedgwick's anecdote inhabits, like Sedgwick, the place of knowing. And in doing so, she knows two things. The first is the name for his sexuality that he hasn't shared through years of discussing the complications of their erotic lives. The other is the sexual charge that attaches to presuming to know that name. Quote, after all, the position of those who think they know something about one that one may not know about oneself is an excited and empowered one, unquote. In an economy where the bountiful, bountiful profits that accrue to homophobic knowingness line the pockets of a masculinist order run by heterosexually identifiable men, Women's and gay men's relation to knowing, especially about each other, risk always, as Sedgwick knows full well, playing out in variously wounding ways the asymmetrical affordances of positioning by gender or sexuality. 
Hence Sedgwick's concern to produce her book as, quote, resolutely non-algorithmic, unquote, precisely in order, quote, not to know how far its insights are generalizable, unquote, and so to avoid the, quote, pretended knowingness by which the chisel of modern homo-heterosexual definitional crisis tends in public discourse to be hammered most fatally home, unquote. Yet epistemology's first two chapters abound in striking instances of mathematical enumeration. They offer the reader charts or graphs and return obsessively to figures of mapping, calculus, and logical declensions. What, we might ask, does it mean that Sedgwick's non-algorithmic book, a book that wants to avoid the fatality of knowing its generalizability, opens with a chapter that bears, of all things, the title axiomatic. Surely this points to the double-edged weapon that Sedgwick is trying to balance. It ironizes the presumption of knowledge implicit in delusional claims like we know what that means or sexuality as we know it today, while permitting the sort of nonce taxonomy, those provisional acts of boundary definition for an anti-homophobic analysis, whose urbanity draws from the very wellspring its irony disdains. It's as if what the book wanted not to know were its own deep investment in knowing, and so in a seeing that takes place at the join where power is soldered to sex. Perhaps that explains the three biblical ghosts I would like to conjure from the book's first chapter. Few will forget the one of the three that epistemology openly names. Esther, whom Sedgwick describes as the very icon of female submissiveness, enters the text as a substitutive figure for a law clerk, gay and closeted, whom Sedgwick imagines in a fantasy mobilized by the decision in Bowers v. Hardwick as coming out to a judge inclined to deem anti-sodomy laws constitutional. Explicitly a stand-in for Sedgwick's gay clerk, Esther stands also in complex relation to the author, to Sedgwick herself, occasioning a remarkable parenthetical digression. Quote, even today, Jewish little girls are educated in gender roles, fondness for being looked at, fearlessness in defense of their people, non-solidarity with their sex, through masquerading as Queen Esther at Purim. I have a snapshot of myself, she continues, at about five, barefoot, in the pretty Queen Esther dress my grandmother made, white satin, gold spangles, making a careful, eyes down, toe-pointed curtsy at presumably my father, who is manifest in the picture only as the flash gun that hurls my shadow, pillaring up tall and black over the dwarfed sofa onto the wall behind me." Unquote. Showing herself here as Esther, just as Esther showed herself, Sedgwick photographs her father's photo to reveal the daughter that he saw, a girl submitting to the gaze of the other while turning her own eyes down and making a deferential curtsy to her father or to his weapon of spectacularization, evoked by the flash gun that functions as its all too ominous metonym. For all the differences Sedgwick draws between Esther and the closeted clerk, what they share is just this capacity to magnetize energies of spectacularization, whether or not they choose to come out by spectacularizing themselves. They are, that is, what is known or made known as objects, not subjects of knowledge. And feminism, claiming the authority to see, to raise its downcast eyes and dispute the gendered distribution of knowledge, finds in Esther only its negative instance, a spectacularization it seeks to disown. Which brings us to the second biblical ghost, this one never named. Evoking the centrality, quote, of homosexuality to wider mappings of secrecy and disclosure, unquote, Sedgwick broaches the permeation of knowingness with the excitations of sex. Quote, in a sense, she writes, this was a process protracted almost to retardation of exfoliating the biblical genesis by which what we now know as sexuality is fruit, apparently the only fruit, to be plucked from the tree of knowledge." Unquote. Sedgwick's use of the catchphrase of facile knowingness, what we now know as sexuality, 
seems to signal, in its lack of irony here, a transgression of the foundational axioms intended to guard against what she elsewhere calls the, quote, terrible one-directionality of the culture's spectacularizing of gay men, unquote. But then here, where the crucial nexus of knowledge with sexual knowingness emerges, what we now know as sexuality is born from the hunger of a woman named Eve. Though Western art has trained its eye on the nakedness of Eve, Eve herself laid bare the world when she looked with a knowing eye. She, not Esther, thus holds the place of feminist transgression. But the knowledge that makes her a feminist establishes a privilege of knowingness too, a dangerous investment in spectacularization, one displaced from social authority, but not from what Sedgwick hails as, quote, the precious devalued arts of gossip, unquote, the almost erotic compulsion to know. That may be why the final ghost in Sedgwick's epistemology can barely be materialized within the text at all. Inheriting Eve's voraciousness for a knowledge too literally deadening, she emerges as the shadowy counterpart of Esther's displacement of genocidal apocalypse. And she does so precisely as the shadow evoked in her father's picture of Eve as Esther. His flash gun, she tells us, quote, hurls my shadow, pillaring up tall and black, unquote. Patriarchy produces three women here, Eve as Esther in white and gold, compliant, her eyes turned down, and the shadowy enlargement of the pliant girl in a flash turned into a pillar. Is it pressing too hard to see this pillaring as the presence of our final ghost, as the barest trace of Lot's wife, a woman unable, though on pain of death, to refrain from gazing at Sodom? But if feminism and gay male analysis seem destined to specular spectacularizations, to trading accusations about their complicity with structures of power, queer theory might read these questions of power as drives and not desires. Sedgwick, though leaving implicit her identifications with Eve and Lot's wife, affirms the, quote, vicariating cathexis, unquote, of her identification with gay men. If she closets what we think we know as her own name, she owns instead a relation to another set of names altogether, names articulated as self-definitions by pre-Stonewall gay men of the 50s, quote, names so exotically coarse and demeaning as to challenge recognition, never mind acknowledgement, leaving in the stigma-impregnated space of refused recognition, sometimes also a stimulating ether of the unnamed, the lived experiment, unquote. The masochistic consolidation of a stigmatized identity. This vicarious identification allows no space for a proper desire. For desire is fixed in relation to the absolute fiat of the drive, making every desire vicarious, merely substitutive, virtually virtual, which is also to say improper, inauthentic, tropological, queer. At this limit point of our knowledge, one wouldn't know Eve, and at this limit point, our knowledge wouldn't know Eve, one might say, from Adam. But Eve and Adam, like Adam and Steve, recoil from that possibility, pursuing instead their fatal desire for the always impossible fruit, their search for a knowledge, a closet, a stigma, a name to call their own. Well, thank God for the provocation of the bland, because that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, next, we have Siobhan Somerville, uh, Somerv Somerville um, who is Associate Professor of English at um, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, Siobhan has written um, beautifully about the intersection of race and sexuality in US literature and history, 
and her new work is on immigration law and US citizenship. Her first book is called Queering the Color Line, Race and the Invention of Homosexuality in American Culture. And her new project, I believe the working title is A Queer Genealogy of Naturalization in the United States. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Um, and pieces of it can be found in um, the American Quarterly Notes Toward a Queer History of Naturalization. And Siobhan is also active as a member of the MLA Executive Committee Division of Gay Studies in Language and Literature. And I will now turn things to her. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you. I actually just wanted to start by thanking um, Aaron and Keith and the rest of um, uh, the faculty and students here who have put together this uh, symposium. I'm really honored to be participating. Um, when Aaron and Keith first contacted me to be part of this symposium, I started thinking about the first time that I encountered Eve Cedric and Epistemology of the Closet. I knew that I had been in graduate school at the time and I began to piece together a chronology, but certain details remained fuzzy. Last weekend, I realized that I should probably look through a pile of boxes that I had stored in various basements and attics over the past 20 years. These dusty, heavy, banged up cardboard bricks have earned me the affectionate mockery of at least one girlfriend over the years who wondered why I should ever want to hold on to their contents, which were marked with labels such as bills from 1991, <laughs> or bibliographies. But my pack rat tendencies paid off. In a box marked graduate school miscellaneous, <laughs> I had kept very neatly a clear record of when I encountered Eve and her work for the first time. And it turns out that some of you were there too. Uncannily, it was 22 years ago to this day that Eve gave a talk that would become the introduction and first chapter of Epistemology of the Closet, our very readings for this morning. The talk was part of a conference called Unsensationally, Lesbian and Gay Studies 87, Definitions and Explorations, organized by the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies at Yale. It's worth noting that there was no physical center it was simply a loose collection of faculty chaired by John Boswell and a bunch of brilliant PhD students, including Regina Kunzel, Beth Povinelli, and George Chauncey. I was in my first semester of graduate school, and though I didn't know it fully at the time, this conference would be utterly formative for me, personally and professionally. Eve spoke as part of a panel entitled The Canon and the Closet, on the right-hand side there. Um, which also included my fellow graduate student, Adrian Donald, along with Michael Moon, who I noted in the margins, um, was speaking that day about Whitman, Alger, and James. And also note that Lee Edelman would present a little paper that afternoon called Homographesis. Um, <laughs> it's kind of blurry, but it's there. As part of her presentation, Eve distributed a handout, a copy of which I had tucked into my program. I know you can't read it, but there are some close-ups. It's fascinating to look at this page in retrospect and to realize how succinctly it captured and projected the key ideas for which epistemology of the closet would become so renowned. It has the charm and poignancy now of being partly written in Eve's own hand and thus gives a sense, to me at least, of the freshness of her ideas at the time as well as their complexity. The page as a whole reminds us that feminist theory was understood as a theoretical framework to be reckoned with at the time. At the top of the page, she quoted an excerpt from Gail Rubin's Thinking Sex, whose insistence that feminism was not adequate as a theory of sexuality would help fuel the mighty field clearing work that Cedric would perform in Epistemology of the Closet. The orderly typescript list of binarisms, which she argues are, quote, inextricably structured through the problematic of homo-heterosexual definition in the 20th century, signals, too, how thoroughly deconstruction saturated available theoretical models and how much more fascinating it became in her hands. In the dynamic caption on the right side of the page,
Cedric explained that she was offering, quote, a hypothesis about contemporary gay and lesbian discourse and controversy, that sexual separatism and gender integrationism under these definitions tend to go together and vice versa. An explanation that again recasts her fundamental concern with the relationship between gender and sexuality. The handwritten disclaimer at the bottom of the page gives us a sketch of what would be the driving concerns or questions that remained constitutively bracketed in the book as a whole. A historicist method, the insistence that there is no necessarily pro or anti-gay content in, to these models of homo-hetero definition, and the gendered asymmetries that adhere to questions of sexuality. At the center of the page, that notorious grid, which is reproduced in the book, seem too intricate um, to be rendered in TypeScript, rather than confining herself within the usual straitjacket of essentialist versus constructionist accounts, she found an elegant and powerful alternative, asserting that we needed to reckon with the coexistence of two competing discourses, which she termed minoritizing and universalizing, rather than trying to choose between the two. As we all know, the generative effects of epistemology of the closet were as profound as her thesis was sweeping. Quote, a whole cluster of the most crucial sites for the contestation of meaning in 20th century Western culture are consequentially and quite indelibly marked with the historical specificity of homosocial, homosexual definition, notably, but not exclusively male, from around the turn of the century, end quote. The boldness of claims like these meant at the time that she simply could not be ignored. While the topic of this panel is feminism and queer theory, as I prepared for it, what has caught my attention is the way that race and ethnicity are positioned within epistemology of the closet and how they function in the text's relationship to feminism and queer theory. In the years since it was written, and particularly in the last 10 years, a robust body of scholarship in queer studies has elaborated the inextricability of race and sexuality, particularly in the US. Much of that work was facilitated by the analytic framework signaled by the term queer, an analytic which was imminent in epistemology of the closet, yet not quite articulated as such. While the book conceptually cleared the way for queer approaches, it still remained tethered to the central terms gay and anti-homophobic, as Lee has already mentioned. Some recent work has argued that the very notion of the gay closet is one that is inherently racialized and, as Marlon Ross has argued, as rendered in epistemology, inherently white. Whatever the merits of that argument, my focus here will be different. I'm interested in those occasional moments where Cedric does engage explicitly with the category of race, those moments when the question of race enters the text only to exit quickly. And for the sake of time, I'll focus on just two examples, one from each of the two chapters that we read for this panel. As I hope I'll show by using Cedric's own reading methods, we can see how race is both fully present in the text and yet somehow not fully disclosed. By looking at these moments, I wanna ask what they might have to do with the larger question of feminism and queer theory. The first example that I'd like to look at occurs in the discussion of Axiom 2. That's the section where Cedric writes that, quote, the study of sexuality is not coextensive with the study of gender. In this section, race is mentioned as part of her explanation of the stakes of separating the study of sexuality from the study of gender. Indeed, she writes, some dimensions of sexuality might be tied not to gender, but instead to differences or similarities of race or class, end quote. Detaching sexuality from gender then might facilitate its attachment to other categories of identity, a moment that seems to anticipate later queer work that explored the very imbrication of race and sexuality. In the same axiom, race is explicitly present in the text again when Cedric carefully lays out why gay or anti-homophobic theory what gay or anti-homophobic theory might learn from feminism, or more accurately, different kinds of feminism. Here is where race becomes salient and where racialized subjects enter the text. Indeed, she writes, quote, it was the long painful realization, not that all oppressions are congruent, but that they are differently structured 
and so must intersect in complex embodiments that was the first great heuristic breakthrough of socialist feminist thought and of the thought of women of color, end quote. In other words, Cedric seems here, in fact, to be careful not to throw the intersectional baby out with the feminist bathwater. However, this point leads her in a surprising direction, at least in hindsight. Rather than considering how the gay subject of her anti-homophobic analysis might in turn be racialized, she instead pivots toward the necessary isolation of sexuality as an analytic category. Quote, each oppression is likely to be in a uniquely indicative relation to certain distinctive nodes of cultural organization, end quote. Race becomes useful here because it is differently structured from gender, a comparison that allows her to claim the differently structured status of sexuality as well. The second example that I'd like to briefly discuss has already been mentioned and comes in the eight-page section of chapter one that focuses on the story of Esther. In this section of the chapter, um, which comes just before she introduces the minoritizing, universalizing grid, Cedric attempts to articulate the capaciousness of the idea of the closet conceptually at the same time that she delineates what is specific about the gay closet. Here her focus is less on identities per se and more on forms of oppression based on identity. Somewhat abruptly, she begins by asserting the self-evidentiary quality of other, quote, modern oppressions. Racism, for instance, she writes, is based on a stigma that is visible in all but exceptional cases, cases that are near, neither rare nor irrelevant, but that delineate the outlines rather than coloring the center of racial experience. So are the oppressions based on gender, age, size, physical handicap, end quote. Here she emphasizes the overarching cultural assumption that these categories, including race, are legible in a way that gay identity is not. Using this emphasis on legibility, Cedric then argues that homophob homophobia is actually more like, in her words, ethnic, cultural, religious oppressions such as anti-Semitism, an assertion that then leads her to her extended discussion of Esther. Although I don't have time to walk through them here, Cedric lays out seven distinct ways in which the scene of Esther's coming out as a Jew is similar to, but most, mostly different from, coming out as gay. Her point is to argue that while ethnic, religious, cultural oppression might be the closest available model of describing the workings of the closet, the analogy between the two ultimately fails. In these two examples to which, for the sake of time, I have certainly not done justice, Race appears explicitly in the text, only then to flash back quickly out of it. It's this oscillating quality that I find so compelling. Of course, race does not have to be explicitly present to be shaping the analysis. Indeed, it would be easy to argue that questions of race are hovering in the language of minority and minoritizing, for, for instance. Yet it is, it is the shimmering function of race in the text itself that I want to draw attention to this morning. And now you see it, now you don't quality, that actually seems deeply connected to the very mechanisms of the closet that Cedric so powerfully takes apart in the book. In writing this talk, I've struggled to find a way to honor Eve's memory in a way that both acknowledges my profound debts to her, truly I could not have done my own work without her own, um, and still leave space for critique to keep questions she raised open and alive rather than sealing them in the past. This past spring, in the weeks after Eve died, Duke University Press asked those of us who were Duke authors to post our responses and tributes on a public website. For a swirl of reasons, I, did, I could not find a way to do so, a speechlessness that nagged me, but seemed insurmountable. I was deeply moved by what others wrote, but I simply could not find the words of my own to contribute. I know rationally that my silence was about the timing of her passing, it came quick on the heels of my father's death last year, which I was still very actively grieving. Perhaps my silence was simply my own refusal to accept that Eve was really gone. But I see now that it was also about the difficulty of rendering my relationship to her in language. I felt a deep intimacy with her, but it was not exactly a personal intimacy. While I had met Eve on a number of occasions over the years, and while it was clear that we were fond of each other, I could not be so presumptuous as to claim our relationship a friendship. 
Yet I was not simply a fellow academic either, or an anonymous reader of her work. My feelings about her were both too personal, but also not personal enough for me to be able to share in public mourning. And I think my inability to decide whether to call her Eve or Cedric in this talk is a symptom of that undecidability. I've been ashamed that I have not posted something on that website. These tangled knots of mourning, shame, silence, and exposure are, of course, precisely the set of questions that were central to Eve's life and work, and she probably would have been the first to understand my stifled grief. Two decades after my first lucky encounter with Eve and her work, the opening words of chapter one of Epistemology of the Closet ring true. The epistemology of the closet is not a dated subject or a superseded regime of knowing. Thank you. Thank you, Siobhan, and, and thank you to all three panelists. This is really a, a wonderful way to start. Um, and now I need to alert you to the fact that there are uh, lovely members of our group circulating with microphones. Can I see, can we see the mics? There's Lindsay in the back with mic number one, and Emily over here with mic number two. So if you would like to um, ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll get to them. Um, but I guess perhaps I'd, I'd like to first just give an opportunity to the panelists if you would like to respond to each other and then we'll open things up. Carolyn. Well, I, um, I'm, I'm so glad Siobhan ended with the uh, idea that the epistemology of the closet is not a dated topic or experience. Um, I, I do think, though, that um, the um, differences in my and Lee's take on the book um, might expose a, um, a certain kind of interesting historical specificity of her of the book. And I mean, of course, she would be the first to want to explore that very thing. But um, uh, and um, I'm asking a question to you, Lee, uh, about um, <laughs> uh, about the um, uh, about the term queer, uh, because um, um, I, I felt as I was writing my talk and as I was reading it, the, the book this time, that there was a certain 80s feminism that was quite palpable. Um, and uh, I have always really appreciated Eve for choosing the word anti-homophobic. And still, I do think, actually, I would recommend that we return to consider anti-homophobic as a theoretical term. Um, but as I recall, we weren't saying queer theory yet. And um, the reason I was so interested in talking about axiom one, people are different from each other, was to suggest that all of those sexual differences were Eve's act of creating the queer as a much more, um, as a much more highly internally differentiated term even then um, anti-homophobic could be. So, um, so I, I know, Lee, that uh, I know that you're talking about a different kind of queer, tr a tropological kind of queer. But wouldn't it also be fair to say that, um, that uh, the, historical, the historical specificity of her book actually it would have prevented her using the word queer rather than it being erased. It wasn't really, it hadn't, she was bringing it into being. It hadn't come into being as the term of art yet. Well, I think that was actually precisely what I was saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I was arguing that what was being erased was not queer from her book, but gay male analysis mm -hmm. or anti-homophobic analysis from the rubric of the panel, mm -hmm. that queer theory, that she, the, the word queer appears twice in the book, but quoted in context where it does not signify in the way we would be using the word mm -hmm. queer, and quoted from other authors who were simply using it. I mean, one was from Melville, I believe, and the second time was in a, 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 a string of definitions, mm -hmm. and it was simply, um, it, had no, it didn't function as queer functions for us at all. I think that you, you, however, so leaving that aside, going back to the, the point about the 
um, desire to exfoliate the uh, infinite possibilities of um, sexual positionings that would multiply the, the, the spaces one could occupy and escape the sort of binaristic uh, specularity of the homo-heterosexual divide, I think it's true that one could say that that's pointing in the direction of something that would later become queer. But it's also, and this is the, the fascinating and enabling contradiction within epistemology, I think, it also is resisting precisely that in favor of the endless proliferation of particularized names. I mean, if, if queer is gesturing toward the, the um, categorical dispensation that would acknowledge the non-binaristic relation of sexuality, it also potentially, from the point of view of epistemology, does the work of, of homogenizing and of erasing itself those, um, the, 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 the sort of plethora of, of identificatory positions that she enjoys so much in thinking about at that moment in the 19th century before homo and heterosexual crystallized as the possibilities of thinking about sex. So I think that there is this double this double imperative within the text that we need to honor at the same time. Right. Does that give you time to think of questions? <laughs> I, have, I have questions if you don't. Does anybody want to get started? Well, I, I guess I'm also curious about, you know, another anachronism. I mean, clearly, and I'm really glad that you pointed out the way that the title builds in a kind of anachronism to the panel, um, an anachronism I'm glad that we've started to, to tangle with a little bit here. Um, but Siobhan, I, I wonder, given this exchange that we've just had, if you can talk about um, how the opening up of queer theory in recent years to discussions of race um, might impact the, this exchange about this idea of the importance of naming multiplicities versus um, Lee's different perspective on queerness. I mean. Um, I think it's a hard question and I, I, I guess I have been, um, you know, I was struck as well very much by um, the question of how do, do we see universalizing as the model that then became the ground for queer. Um, so, so even as, um, as epistemology of the closet insists on keeping those two, um, keeping the contradiction alive, it's precisely the contradiction which is at the center of the book, um, did the field choose um, the universalizing um, model? Uh, Ironically, uh, for me, just looking at the work that has sort of grown up around um, race and sexuality, particularly queer of color critique, um, that, that shift that um, allowed us to think about normative as um, kind of the target of our critique um, actually helped, I think, open up questions of, of of race more readily. Um, I'm not sure if that is a good answer, but that's what comes to mind. Well, I would just add that um, I, I think uh, if Eve were rewriting that part today, she would not have emphasized the visibility of race I, because, yes. of course, that's you know that's been completely undermined as a way of dealing with the subject. And that's startling, actually, to read that passage now that takes for granted the, the visibility of the, not, not only race, but those other categories, which have obviously been so uh, deeply complicated. Um, uh, but I, I think what I'm interested in is, is that, an, is, is it actually, would, would she have, if she had rewritten it, would then it have affected um, the rest of the book? That is, is that a constitutive move um, to actually open the door, I, I mean, I see it as sort of, you know, you open the door on race, but you have to shut it in order to do what she wants to do um, in some ways. In order to talk about the specificity, um, I, I think at least in those moments in the text, it seems like she could have elaborated, and yet 
and she's well aware that she could have elaborated, um, and yet has to kind of shut that door. We know it's there. We know race is functioning as a ground against which sexuality is being marked, but it can't be discussed, it can't be on the surface of the text in any kind of sustained way, I think. Um, or at least there wasn't the kind of apparatus to do that at that point. Oh, there we go. Um, I, uh, I, I wanted to ask a question uh, about literature. Uh, Eve Sedgwick's training was in literature and her uh, examples were literary examples, um, not to essentialize literature, but I wondered uh, if the panelists could talk a little bit about the, uh, the role of the literary imagination in the kind of um, uh, interrogations of categories and, and social forms uh, you know, in terms of the kinds of assertions or non-assertions that literature makes and her relationship to that. Um, you know, why uh, is a literary critic, in particular perhaps someone very sensitive to the way literature uses language and makes claims, who is opening up these kinds of questions without closing them uh, down again? Okay, I'll take that on. <laughs> Uh, I, I think um, she does quite specifically say that uh, her method is uh, based on the literary text um, and the de- and rehistoricization act. But so she grounds her uh, search for evidence in literature, um, and she calls it that. So um, it seems to me that she that she's... Um, more than implying that the literary is the place where these um, contradictory uh, models can be, um, I, w I almost said beautifully, over overlaid. On e um, th this is the place where the contradictions can be seen because literature, of course, is not science, and so in literature, uh, P and non-P can e easily coexist in every in every place. So, uh, as um, in her uh, relation to deconstruction in those years, I think she's um, a, um, her creative act is to name the so-called definitional binarisms, to find them, construct them, name them, and um, assert those as a as um, the space of the literary. Uh, that that is to say, you know, where these contradictions live is the literary and um, then her her act uh, her literary act in response is to is to find them and name them and I think um, her deconstruction uh, really is um, especially beautiful insofar as uh, the definitional binarisms that she does find and construct are quite surprising I think over here next I have, is this working? Mm -hmm. I have a question for Professor Edelman. Hi. Thanks for your great talk, as usual. Um, you know, I, could you could people? That was Bonnie Costello in the back. But could you also just say who you are? So we. My name is Heike Schott, and I'm from UMass Boston. Um, Thank you. I have a question. I would need a minute with your talk, and I would need to read it again. I think to fully get the argument. But I have a question, regardless. Um, it occurred to me the third ghost you talked about that haunts epistemology of the closet. I wonder, given the double-edged character of naming that you talked about in this, at work in this text, what you would have to say about the fact that Lot's wife has no name. No, it's, an, it's, it's a question that if I had had more than the 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, I, I certainly would have wanted to address because the only, ref, the only reference that we have to this character is in the gendered position of Lot's wife. And, and she remains that thing which is unnamed and then is dehumanized. I mean, she turns into the, the pillar of salt. She becomes the, the, the monument to uh, a forbidden desire, which is to see, to look, to appropriate. So that she, she stands in this strange relation between Esther and Eve in that she, she uh, aspires to knowledge and is punished for knowledge and is punished for knowledge not by becoming the mother of mankind, you know, in, in, in pain and suffering she will bring forth her children, but instead becoming this thing 
which is literally a thing, which is removed from the register of the human altogether, as if in a mirror image of the spectacle of apocalyptic destruction that she has been fascinated by and turned back to witness. So that there, there is a, a, a punitive relation to her will to know that is, that is writ large, and yet in a certain heroic model, her namelessness remains, uh, remains the name for a desire whose imperative is almost like the Kantian analogy of the man who, uh, knowing that he is going to go to the gallows if he spends the night with the woman he desires, nonetheless chooses to do so. Can I ask the dumb version of that then? So she's the queer Eve? Well, you see, I'm, uh, the, I, I don't know that that's the dumb version, but that's a naming that I don't want to make. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Uh, we have someone over here, Emily. I think oh. the, next over here, and okay, then in sure. the I'll be back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you do. <laughs> you do because you're being taped. So please do wait. We want your voice. <laughs> yeah. I, I just wanted to, to say that this is not a major theoretical intervention or anything that I'm making, but I was totally shocked when you came up with uh, the Pillar of Salt, because to me it seemed very clear that it was the column of smoke with the fire inside it uh, that led the people out of Egypt and into the Promised Land uh, that that was an image of. And it's, so it's a choice that you made to, to, to see it as a dehumanized, disabled lump of salt instead of um, the visible image of God. And I wondered if that had occurred to you too since you were thinking so biblically. No. Uh, <laughs> nor am I frankly persuaded. Um, I, I, I don't believe that columns and pillars are identical in their signifier. And it seems to me that the flash that turns a woman into a pillar doesn't evoke for me the column of smoke that leads the chosen people out of Egypt. Well, yes, the answer to that is obviously yes. One, one's always making a choice when one reads, and there's a wonderful passage in epistemology where Eve makes clear that uh, she's saying, what will be the definitive proof of the success of my argument, and what will, will allow us to know that this task has been completed? And she said it won't be simply the um, pragmatic introduction of countless examples that will persuade by sheer force of number. It will have to be the patience, depth, and persuasiveness of one's own close analysis. And ultimately, there is no guarantee that any analysis will ever be persuasive to another except the sheer rhetorical force with which it's made. Um, one of the things that I, I guess I would have to say in going back to Bonnie's question is that it seems to me that where the literary is concerned, the greatness of Eve is that she is simply a magnificent reader, that she allows us the opportunity to see what happens when a brilliant mind lingers in a text, with a text, and on a text in ways that flash up with surprises, but that flash up with surprises by attending to the specific language that the text is using and allowing that language suddenly in a flash to offer us a vision that we hadn't had before. Hi, um, I'm actually a first time reader of Sedgwick and um, in, uh, I've had a semester of preparation by being um, fortunate enough to attend Professor Murphy's lectures twice a week um, in, in family critique. And um, I was wondering, um, we discuss throughout our readings um, the binary between um, the public and private, and between the tacit and explicit. And I was wondering, as a first-time reader of Sedgwick, how do we reconcile her, categor her categorizations of um, the, the, homopho the homophobic and the, ho the homosexual um, in light of this kind of public and private uh, dichotomy? Does that make sense? I'm hoping that makes sense. I'm an undergraduate. <laughs> Yay! Yay. <laughs> of course, it made sense. I um I I, I just have I don't have a full answer to your question by any means, but I just have two um, 
uh, association, so if I can remember them both, I at least have one, <laughs> that, um, uh, you know, Eve is, in epistemology of the closet, Eve is really um, concerned about the downsides of privacy. In her trenchant critique of Bowers v. Hardwick, she points out that um, to base the defense um, on the right to privacy is already to give away a lot of ground, and that that's um, so. That's one thing. Uh, maybe I'll just stop there. That um, the privileging of privacy over publicity is not at all what she's about. Um, I I might take up that point by bringing it back to. Um, maybe not something that is directly in epistemology of the closet, but I think is important to consider um, in terms of um, race and the relationship between uh, public and private. And, and sort of to think about that question of the history of a racialized closet or the functioning of a racialized closet um, in relation to to racialized histories of publicity and privacy. And I think we could kind of, I, I was very, um, as I was rereading this text and thinking about how close it was to the Bowers versus Hardwick decision, just to uh, think about that um, a little bit more, um, that the questions are, um, that the logic uh, of, of cordoning off sexuality into the private is, is very much a part of what the case that is seen as overturning Bowers versus Hardwick, and, and that's Lawrence and Garner versus Texas. Um, but as I've ar argued elsewhere, and other people have pointed out as well, Lawrence and Garner versus Texas itself um, is uh, produced through a racialized moment. So um, uh, one, one of the one of them was black and one was white. Garner is black and, and uh, or was. Um, he, he's uh, passed away. But um, the case itself um, was produced by the police going into an unlocked apartment and finding two men having sex. And the case was argued as a case about two men having consensual sex in a private space. And the the but the police would never have been on the scene unless they had been called to the scene because one of them was black. That is, a black man um, was there. And um, that, is, that is part of the kind of ground upon which that case rests, even though it is, it's never mentioned in the case. And the case itself produces a kind of notion of a transcendent private uh, space where there is legitimate uh, where there can be legitimate same-sex sex, but the public is kind of still marked as a space where sexuality can't be. Um, so that's, that's just a kind of foot, footnote on that, that question. It's really useful. I think we, we started a little late, so maybe we could just squeeze in two more. I saw two hands, um, one in the back. Holly, you want to? I'm from Boston University. I actually have a question that ties into the reading of Bowers v. Harvick, so that was a good segue. There's a passage, and I've, I've scrawled it down, hopefully correctly, um, where she talks about um, the ruling and the interpretations that, go, that, that come with it, which include the claim to be able to read, i.e. project, into the minds of the gay advocates, this being not only a parody of, but more intimately, a kind of aggressive jamming technique against the paranoid fantasy that, um, that it is gay people who can read or project their own desires into the minds of straight people. And I wondered if any of you had any comments on, because that's sort of the extreme of privacy, you know, public-private, of that there's actually this connection you know, between minds. There's sort of this you know, barrier of, you know, well, we're going to, you know, believe that we can project into your mind so that we don't have to think about that you can project into ours. And I wondered if any of you had any thoughts on that passage. Thank you for coming, by the way. <laughs> uh, well, she soon after Epistemology of the Closet would write her um, new preface to the coherence of Gothic conventions about um, the paranoid Gothic. 
So she was beginning to think hard about uh, paranoia and projection. And I think that the, um, the um, model of um, uh, gay straight projections in both directions was um, troubling her in epistemology of the closet. And I don't think necessarily that it should be um, mapped onto the public-private distinction, since of course it's phantasmatic, and um, uh, whereas the public-private distinction could actually be located in some form of um, constructions in the, in in historically specified terms. But that's about as far as I could get right now. What about you two? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that it's, it's clear that, that that is the moment where paranoia is becoming uh, a, a crucial factor in thinking about these relations of homophobic enforcement. Um, but it's also important, I think, to see that without that paranoia, the reading energy of epistemology of the closet would have been impossible, um, that, that the ability that Eve herself is demonstrating in that wonderful passage where she's reading the word facetious is all about a projection into the minds of the justices who are writing that particular passage. So that it's easy to demonize paranoia as if it were something that one could get over or if it were <laughs> simply a limitation or if it were simply the source of violence against which there were an alternative. But I think the, the brilliance of Eve's development over her career, and, and this is my own relation to her work on the reparative versus the paranoid as well, is that I, I cannot believe that there isn't, wasn't, and still isn't, uh, an ironic recognition that all of her attempts to differentiate the reparative from the paranoid fall under the logic of the paranoid. <laughs> and that therefore, even that binarism is a reflection of the inescapability and the productivity of a paranoia that isn't simply superseded or displaced by any move toward the reparative. One more. Got it? Um, hello, I'm Claudia, I'm, I'm independent. <laughs> um, and I, I feel bad because I'm the last question, so I feel like I should just say something and you guys don't even need to respond to it or, or say something really fast. But uh, I... You have plenty of time. I'm interested in this, in the, the name of this being feminism and queer theory in that uh, what you said, Lee, when, when you were talking about the, uh, uh, the uh, way that um, the reader of Proust could be... Uh, assumed, or it would be, it would, it, it, I don't remember if you got this from Eve's text or from your own deduction, but that the, it is a woman and, and ideally a, a mother. No, that was um, Eve. That, was that, okay, I just loved that, but I also started going off on a feminism versus queer theory thought tangent where I was thinking that in the idea that it's a, a woman who is a mother, that there's a closing off of the sexuality of that person, um, that the the gaze, uh, the, the incessant gaze onto the text is this sort of uh, motherly looking at this thing and, and, and or this person, this, this Proust or uh, narrator as this person who is or isn't gay or is or isn't, has certain sexualities, but that there's this sudden erasure of the sexuality of the gazer. And, that, and, and so I've been thinking about how, you know, with Mary pointing out that, you know, Lot's wife has no voice or is somehow a pillar or whatever, that there's this sort of erasure of, of, of sexuality coming from the position of feminist. You know, feminist is a woman, but she's not a, a gay woman or a straight woman or a queer woman or a non-sexual woman or a whatever. Uh, so there's this, there's this um, I mean, you were pointing this out too when you were talking that there's this, uh, um, I guess I'm just wondering, and I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this into a question, but that, um, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure where I'm going, except that it, it seems like maybe a sexism, but I'm not too sure if that's the right word, but you know, that there's this lack of voice, or I'm sorry, lack of ability to say who's talking or who's reading when it comes to the, the female, and, and, and the, the, there's, a queer, there's a queer male, but there's not so much of a 
Am I making any sense? Yes, I would say, A, good point. And B, um, I think Eve is, is uh, trying to convert that sexism. She, she does, that is her argument at the end of the book, um, convert that sexism into an assertion of the eros of knowing, you know, the, as kind of an epistemological erotics that she's inhabiting. So it's truly, it is a dodge in a way Oh, she's not interested in the question of the sexuality of that mother reader, but she is interested in um, the erotics of her own of her know of her knowing. I, I think that's absolutely right. I think that there's a a double valence to that, though, and and that double valence comes, I think, from the fact that there is a security and a privilege that comes from the non-availability of the woman's sexuality. I mean, it's, it's not, oh, it's being erased, it's also potentially that it's being concealed. Mm -hmm. And that, that concealing can bestow power as the spectacularization of the gay man's sexuality can inflict vulnerability. And it seems to me in that regard, one interesting tact, and I think this is something that, that Carolyn's wonderful talk helps us to see, would be to think about the ways in which Throughout epistemology, the figurations of reproduction and of uh, generativity are legion. Eve identifies herself as a number of things. One is a non-procreative adult. But she ends the first chapter of Epistemology of the Closet pairing twice. In fact, I have it here, so I'll quote it. So since they're her words, I don't want to misquote them. She ends it talking about, okay, it's actually, it's, it's Eve, so I'm gonna take the liberty of reading two sentences. I have no optimism at all about the availability of a standpoint of thought from which either question could be intelligibly, never mind efficaciously adjudicated, given that the same yoking of contradictions has presided over all the thought on the subject and all its violent, and pregnant modern history mm. that has gone to form our own thought. Now the next, last sentence. Instead, the more promising project would seem to be a study of the incoherent dispensation itself, the indisseverable girdle of incongruities under whose discomforting span for most of a century have unfolded both, both the most generative and the most murderous plots of our mm. culture. Mm. So violent and pregnant generative and murderous. Not to mention the passage I quoted in the end of my talk where she talks about stigma impregnated. Hmm. But I, I'd also add that she um, is a daughter and in the figure, in that photograph that you read so beautifully, um, or her writing of the photograph, there is no mother also. So there is an, mm -hmm. there is an absence of, of that it's maternal figure. Right, right. So yeah, that's really interesting, I think, um, is the mother's absence in the Esther scene. Well, I think that'll lead us beautifully into the next panel after we get a break. So please go nourish yourselves, um, and I'll see you in a little bit. Thank you so much to all our panelists. <laughs>